Mission Phoenix offering this month. It goes toward the food pantry, so if you'd like to give toward that, we'll make sure it gets to them uh, toward the end of the month. They'll be handing those out, so uh, give as you need to or would like to. And you see in your bulletin an envelope uh, for a special offering all the churches are asked to take today, and that is the Native American Ministries uh, offering. You see on the back side of that exactly where these uh, funds will go to is to help with scholarships, uh, and to help with Native American ministries uh, throughout the uh, throughout the country and some right here in our own conference area. So if you'd like to give to that uh, fund, just put it in there and drop it in the offering plate in a little bit, and we'll know exactly where that goes to. Uh, but take a look at that and see if you'd like to give. A few other announcements on the insert uh, have to do uh, with some things that are going on and upcoming. One of them is uh, the uh, Mission Blitz. You see some information there on the Mission Blitz coming up. Uh, May 4th. If you have any questions, you can contact us or Deanne, and she'll help you out as well. But there's some good information there. Comes up May 4th. You also see a special collection for the safari apartments. Uh, just small summer toys that we'll be doing during the month of April. There's some information there, as well as an announcement about our upcoming event on May Day, May 1st at 10:30. Uh, you'll be hearing more about that as the weeks go on. We just want you to know about that and put it. In your calendar. So look those over. Oh, also, uh, this is Doe for Doe Sunday, uh, our ministry where we help other sister churches around the conference, around the district. Uh, the, the goodies on the table out here uh, uh, that you can just donate to and pick up a goodie, all of those, most of those goodies uh, are given by the book club. So uh, there's going to be some good stuff out there. Uh, so take a look at that if you'd like to give and help support that ministry that we help out a couple of times a year. Uh, we would appreciate that, so we wanted to let you know that. Also, uh, I know uh, Jeff, where is Jeff? Call over there is, has an announcement, so Jeff, come on up and uh, look over the rest of those announcements and uh, see where you need to be this week, and that'll be a big help. So we'll let you use that mic.
Even though we're going to wish we could keep Paul forever, his appointment will be for one year as he is planning to retire. I am confident that the Holy Spirit has been and is at work in this process, providing, providing everything that we need to grow in our faith, love, service, and worship of God. And I'm also confident that when the time comes for us to grow again, the Holy Spirit will faithfully provide again. In closing, Pastor Wolf said he would cover the prayers for our congregation, and I assured him that they would be plentiful. He said that he would be praying for our congregation as well. Um, we will keep you informed on any other upcoming activities that we get planned, including um, farewells for Dr. Dighton and uh, any activities that we plan and dates for the uh, incoming Pastor Paul Wolf. So stay tuned, and we'll let you know as we find out more. Thank you all. Okay, thanks, Jeff. I think uh, you'll enjoy Paul. He's a, he's a nice guy. He gets along very well uh, in what he does. So I think you'll enjoy Paul. Uh, he's done some good things down in wrestling uh, and Parsons, so he's just moving uh, up the road a little bit. So you'll get to know him uh, pretty well, uh, pretty quickly. He's a very personal uh, pastor and a guy that you'll enjoy. So all of that having been said, uh, 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 Paul or uh, Jeff said we'll be keeping you informed as we can for things that are coming up, getting ready for that transition. Let's take a moment now, stand, welcome those around you with the peace of Christ, then we'll come together uh, with the enemy.
minister of our Heavenly Father. Father God, Father, we thank you. Yet, Father, for, for another day. Father, it's a, it's a beautiful, glorious, bright, sunshiny day. Not just because the sunshine is shining, the Lord, your, your Son, our Savior, your one and only begotten Son, Lord, that you sent to this earth to die for our sins. Lord Jesus, we're here for you this morning. We're here to sing your praises, to lift you up, Lord, to acknowledge that you are our Lord and Savior and King of Kings. Father, we ask that your Spirit be here this morning, your Holy Spirit be amongst us. As we're here to serve you, we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. You may be seated. If the kids will come down, we'll have some children's time for them. And the ushers will be handing out our guest registration. So if you would like to sign those, that would be a big help for us uh, in the office each week. So come on down. Look, you want to be landed down good. Come on up here, guys. You can come up a little closer. Come on. A little closer. A little closer. How are you guys doing? Doing all right? I didn't bring anything with me today, but I think you'll understand what I'm going to be talking about here in just a second. Uh, how many of you play baseball or softball? Yeah. So you all know how the games are played. I was watching the news the other night and saw a story about a baseball game. You know how it is. There's two teams and they each wear a different colored uniform so you can tell them apart. But they also wear some things that are very uh, common. They wear all hats and all wear cleats, right, and those sorts of things. Uh, uh, so they wear those every time they play a game. But there's one person on each team that always wears more gear than the rest of the players. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The catcher, yeah. The catcher, the person who's behind the plate, catching all the balls the hitter misses, right? And he has on, what, he has a face mask, and has a chest pad, has the shin pads, what else? Yeah, okay. So he's got, now why would he have all that extra gear? Right, to protect himself in case the ball hits it, he misses the ball and hits it would help him not be hurt quite as bad, right? Well, that's a pretty good thing to have. The Bible tells us, Paul tells us, I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, but Paul tells us that God gives us some things that we could use every day that would protect us as well, that would help us stand strong, Paul says, that might help us stand against wrong and do the right thing. And he says there are several things. I'm just going to mention two or three of them just to be right again. Yeah. Paul says we've been given the gift of truth. Truth about God. And if we want to know who God is and what God is like, who do we have to know? Who do we look to know who God is like? Who did God give us? Jesus, right? If you want to know who Jesus or God is, you look to Jesus. That's right. He's given us the gift of faith so that we can stand against anything that comes our way. He's given us the gift of salvation so we can stand strong. He's given us all these things, and we have to use them every day so we'll be strong. So just like a catcher has to put on a face mask and a chest pad and knee and shin guards and all of those things, at every game, you and I have to remember that God's given us the truth, He's given us the gift of salvation, He's given us the gift of faith, and those things. He's given us the scriptures, which is what's up there. He's given us the Bible, so we can know what is right and what is wrong. And we have to remember that every day so that we can stand strong. Not that there was a lot to do every day. So every morning when we get up, we all sit on the edge of the bed and remember those things that God's given us so that we can be strong. Okay? And stand against whatever might come our way that might try to hurt us. Right? So let's start doing that every day. Every day. Okay? All right, let's have a prayer. Anybody want to say a prayer? You want me to say it today? Okay, let's say the prayer. Let's bow and say a prayer. Dear God, we're grateful for all the things that you have given to us to help us be strong and to stand against anything wrong that might come our way. Help us to remember them each day, and we'll be thankful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, thanks for coming up, guys.
While choir takes position, uh, I want to let you know I am blessed with a big boss and a building boss who are very musical and love music and have passion for music. Uh, we are blessed indeed. Uh, my building boss the other day, which we were talking about music, things music, and he said, you know what we had, you know, and he just brought it up, said, we've lost hymns in the church. We don't sing hymns anymore. None of our people where he worships, no hymns, any hymns. It's all modern and, and what older hymns are brought up. It's a, it's a new rhythm that's, that's placed with it, and it's, it's, it's an altered melody line in many cases. And he said, we have lost our hymns. I said, you know what? We have, we have a very capable uh, organist. We are blessed with musicians in our church. And we are blessed with instruments that, that uphold the hymns written in the 16th century and were recorded as of old. If it were not for church music of old, we would not have music today. They recorded it. They wrote it down, the great composers. Bach composed in triple meter because of Father, Son, Holy Ghost was given to God. God the key. And we haven't lost that here. And I thank God for that. Uh, okay. On. And at the end of our at, at the end of our prayer, what honors our choir so much is of all God's people to say. Amen. Oh, when you hear that, that is so cool.
as a choir finds their place. If you will take your hymn on a turn to our call to prayer, uh, chorus is number 507 through the hall. We will sing through this just one time as a way of preparing ourselves for a time of prayer. And you may remain seated for this number 507. Let's sing together.
You have provided us with everything we needed each day this past week, and we know that you will provide for us again this coming week. You'll give us opportunities. You will see us through. You will be with us in every way, whatever we do. And so we offer to you our thanks this morning. For all of these gifts, make us aware of the beauty of the world around us, that we might take care of it better and remember where it comes from. This morning we pray our thanks for those who love us and care for us, even when we are not deserving. We are grateful for days of good health and moments of laughter and for all the blessings that make our lives meaningful and worthwhile. But we also pray for those in our minds and on our hearts this morning who for whatever reason are not with us and for those who struggle in various ways with grieving, with loss, with challenges they did not expect, with their health and decisions they have to make that will affect many people, for those who are suffering in various ways and we don't even know who they are, we pray for you to be with them whatever way they need you to be, to provide comfort and wisdom, to give them strength for the day, to provide for them what it is they need this time of day and this week, and to watch over them all. For those who serve us, those who lead us, for your church, wherever it serves, we pray that you would make it a blessing to those it serves. That you would continue to use your church in whatever ways you see fit that we may follow you unafraid and without fear or any regrets, even when we are uncertain where you are leading us. We pray for ourselves here this morning. Again, to thank you for bringing us together and working in us even as we speak to hear your word to us, but also for us to give our best in return. That you would open us up to hear you Help us to set aside those things that distract us, that we may give our best to you, and for this we will be thankful. And we pray all of these things faithfully and expectantly in the name of your Son, whose life we still celebrate during the season of the Easter. And in his name we pray this prayer he has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Draw us close, O Lord, as the scriptures are read and the word proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be only one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Amen. And if you have a Bible or have, have one handy, our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, where Paul writes to the uh, Ephesians. Uh, some words of encouragement, and this has to do with the armor of God, a familiar piece to a lot of us. But here's what Paul writes. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against the enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and have done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication or in prayers for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's bow for our prayer. Lord God, we are grateful again for the gift of your word to us. We have heard this scripture many times, many of us have, but we ask that you would make it fresh to us this morning. Speak to us what it is you have us to hear, so that we may become the people you have us to be. So give us ears to hear you, minds to understand you, hearts to receive what it is you have for us, that it may take root in all of our lives and bear fruit, but not for our sakes alone, but also for the sake of the world that you've entrusted to us. And we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Let me ask you by a show of hands, how many of you here can name the food pyramid? You know what I'm talking about, right? How many of you now, not just know what I'm talking about, how many of you can name those five, the each servings of the five food, food groups we're supposed to take in today? Anybody know? Bacon, 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 and donuts. And we got chocolate, coffee, you know, we, can, we got all of those things. So that's pretty close, I'm impressed. But we all know what I'm talking about, right? We know what the food pyramid is. It's changed some over the years. We learned about it, first of all, in, uh, in grade school. And, and in the past 10 years, it's changed a couple of times. But it has stayed essentially the same. But uh, uh, it's hard to remember some of those five food groups and how many servings of each that we're supposed to get every day. Uh, but uh, we know what I'm talking about, that food pyramid that has been recommended uh, for us to remain healthy and strong. Some time ago, it's been quite a while, I was in the doctor's office, and you know how that goes. I was called back to the exam room, and after having given the nurse all that information she needs, and she writes it down, and as she's leaving, she always says, the doctor will be with you shortly. Yeah, I think it's, they're all trained to say shortly. They'll be with you shortly. So I sit there as you do, and we wait, and we wait. We wait some more, and it gets kind of boring, right? There's not a lot to do in the doctor's office unless you like to wipe it through the drawers and all of those things, you know, which I'm, I'm just saying, you know, play with the tongue depressors and, and all the other equipment. But it gets kind of boring, kind of frustrating, and there's not a whole lot to do. In fact, you've already read through those six magazines that are in that little rack on the wall above the chair. You read all of those the last time you were in the doctor's office one year ago. Uh, so you know, it gets kind of boring. And so you begin to think, and I begin to think, 
that a good way to pass the time is to read all those posters and, and things that are on the walls, you know, talking about the latest cholesterol medicine, or talking about how your inner ear functions, or the circulatory system of your body. And how, so I began to read those, thinking it will help pass the time. It doesn't, but I read that anyway. And I come across, and I didn't even pay attention to it on the wall until I stood in front of it, that food pyramid. That chart that shows you what we're supposed to ingest every day to remain healthy and strong. And so I'm looking, looking at it, kind of reading it, see if I can remember anything uh, from it, uh, about it from the uh, grade school. And it doesn't take me very long to realize I don't get anywhere near reaching the minimum daily requirements of any of those foods. And to be honest, I don't know anybody who does. I mean, think about this. Who could be expected to ingest two to three servings of meat, fish, or poultry, plus two to three servings of milk or cheese or yogurt, milk products, in addition to three to five servings of veggies, on top of two to four servings of fruit, plus anywhere from six to 11 servings of whole grains, wheat, pasta, rice, every day. That's every day. And they have been telling us, whoever they are, that that's the minimum daily requirement in order for us to stay healthy and strong. Even though I don't know anybody that lives, that gets anywhere close to it, I certainly don't. But it's good to have a goal, I suppose, to shoot for. It's good to have that kind of information filed away somewhere. So as I'm standing there looking at this chart, I got to thinking about not just our physical health, but what about our spiritual health as well? I mean, we tend to overemphasize or be overconcerned with our physical bodies. We try to get enough sleep. We try to eat the right foods. We try to get enough exercise. We take our vitamins every day. All of those are good things. We need to do them. We ought to be doing them every day. But why can we not give at least the same level of, of attention or concern to our spiritual lives as we do to our physical bodies? Why is it that we wait until there is some crisis that we are facing before we start worrying about our spiritual Cells or spiritual lives. I mean, you heard me a couple of weeks ago refer to this as a, the spare tire syndrome. We don't give our spare tires in our cars a second thought until we are in a crisis and we need them, and then we start praying that it's in good condition. Why can't we give our spiritual lives as much attention as we do our physical selves? See, I think that's exactly what Paul is doing in our scripture lesson this morning to the Ephesians. What do we need to do to protect ourselves, to make ourselves stronger, and to ensure our spiritual health? What could we do that would keep us strong and, as Paul says, ready always to take a stand whenever something comes our way, ready to meet whatever life may offer us each day? What could we do? Now, if you're like most people, myself included, this is probably a pretty much a constant struggle for you, isn't it? I mean, we all struggle to make sure our lives count for something good. We all struggle to make sure that we are not caught up in our own little worlds. We all struggle with wanting to become a part of something bigger or something better than ourselves. And if you're like that, if you're one of those people that are like that, then I think what Paul has to say in our lesson today offer some help and guidance. In these few verses, about 11 verses, Paul lists for us what I call the minimum daily requirements for, for Christians to stay healthy and strong. Now let me give you the back story here. Paul kind of hints at it, but I want, want to be clear. That in Paul's day, people believed that evil spirits inhabited the air around us 
Paul refers to that as the heavenly realm. But he's talking about the air around us. You can't see them. You don't always know they are there. But the spirits that are able inhabit the air around us just waiting for that opportunity to invade our lives. The, the right moment to come in and invade our lives. Now, we may or may not agree with Paul's beliefs or take them literally. But I think all of us would agree that we don't have to look very far or very hard in the world before we see evil exists all around us. We may not think there are little spirits hovering around us, but we would probably all agree that it doesn't take a whole lot of looking before we see evil somewhere and often close by. Now, if we're not careful, We'll be, brought, we'll be brought up short when some crisis comes our way or when we have to face some evil. So that's why Paul offers these words. Now, at the time Paul is writing these words, and he hints at it near the end of our lesson for the day, at the time Paul is writing these words, he is under arrest. And he is literally, as was the custom of many prisoners of the day, he was literally chained to a Roman guard who watched over him day after day while he was serving his sentence. The guards may change, but he was chained to a guard as he served out his sentence. And as he sees this guard or these guards day after day, he notices their armor, not like medieval armor, although that's on the front of your bulletin because I couldn't find a good picture of Roman armor at the last minute, but, but this is a different kind of armor. As he sees it day after day, he sees a picture. The guard's armor suggests to Paul some ways that you and I could protect ourselves from this evil that is all around us and, as he says, stand strong. And so what he does for us is he takes that Roman soldier's armor piece by piece, part by part, and he translates it into Christian terms and encourages us to know that in order for us to protect ourselves and to stand strong in any crisis, we need to put on this armor. He calls it the whole armor of God. And we need to put it on each day. We need to take it up each day. So what I'd like to do this morning is go over those pieces of armor and kind of expand on what all this meaning. Uh, I hope they make some, uh, uh, give you some clarification on exactly what he's meaning. Uh, and you can take it up each day. Now, there are seven parts to this armor that Paul talks about, but you and I often forget the seventh and the last part. We usually concern ourselves more readily and more easily with the first six because of the way Paul writes about it, but there are seven pieces. And we're going to go over them briefly just to give you an idea of what to do to keep yourself healthy. So let's look at them. The first piece that you know, that that Paul says that we ought to put on every morning is we ought to put on the belt of truth around our waist. Put on around our waist this belt of truth. The belt in Roman armor was always the first piece put on, and it held almost everything else in place. It held this Roman guard's sword, it held his breastplate and other parts secure, or a little more secure, so they wouldn't shift so easily or even fall off. So Paul says we need to put this on. The first thing he says we need to put on each day is the truth, to be absolutely certain about the truth. Now, what is the truth? Well, for Paul, the truth was with a capital T, and the truth was Jesus. Now, in our day, truth is relative, right? I mean, that's what we like to think. That's what we're, we hear, that what's true for me may not be true for you and vice versa. But for Paul, the truth, with a capital T, was always found in Jesus. Jesus is the truth about God. Jesus is the truth about what God is really like. If you want to know what God is like, Paul is saying, all you have to do is look to Jesus. All you have to do is get to know Jesus. And being a disciple of Jesus was absolutely necessary to knowing that truth with a capital T. Put on this truth, Paul is saying, and everything else 
holds into place. Fail to put on this truth, and everything will fall apart at the first hint of a crisis. So Paul says, first thing to do, put around your waist this belt of truth. Know what the truth is. Then he says we need to put on this breastplate of righteousness. Now, righteous, the word righteous means literally, it can translate to be morally clean or guiltless. To be morally clean or guiltless. In order to stand strong, Paul teaches, we must do all we possibly can to remain guiltless or to remain morally clean. Which means we have to ask ourselves some tough questions and be honest with ourselves on a regular basis. Do I practice what I preach? Do I say one thing and do another? Is my integrity or my character intact? Those sorts of questions. We need to do whatever we can to remain morally clean. We have to live each and every day in such a way that there is no doubt in the eyes or in the minds of others that you and I are righteous people. Morally clean, guiltless, people of integrity, and people of good character. We have to do whatever we can to be righteous. Paul says we need to put on that righteousness every day. Plato, the great philosopher, was once accused by an enemy of his of having committed a crime. His opponent didn't like what Plato taught, didn't agree with it, so he started spreading rumors about a crime that Plato was involved in. And immediately all of, or many of Plato's students and his adherents rallied around Plato and began talking to him about how he should respond, and most of the suggestions were to seek revenge. To accuse your accuser, that's the easy thing to do. It's quick, it's easy, and so they all suggested, why don't you just accuse your accuser? But Plato said, no. We must all live in such a way as to prove all accusations false. That's righteousness. Paul says we need to take up righteousness, remember it. Claim it as our own every day in order to remain strong and healthy. So put on, he says, this breastplate of righteousness. The third thing Paul says we must do is to do whatever we need to do to fit our feet so that we are ready to share the good news. Now, in Paul's day, and even somewhat in our day, sandals were a symbol of people who were ready to move. In other words, a Christian is a person who is always ready to move and take the good news to those who need to hear it, to show them and to tell them, word indeed, this good news. Just like a soldier must always stand ready, a good soldier must always stand ready to do battle, Paul is saying the Christian must always be ready to take this good news to whomever needs it, wherever, and in whatever way to share that good news. Must always be with it. So, let's ask ourselves this question, something for us to think about the rest of the day. Whom do you know right now? A person you know, think of this person, who could use a good word, a word of encouragement, or a kind deed. And are you ready to share that with that person? Are you ready to do anything to share the good news with anybody, whatever it takes? Paul says we need to have ourselves ready, to have our feet ready to move and to share this good news with whoever needs to hear it. And we need to do that every day to stay healthy. Paul says we need to take up our shield of faith, which protects us against temptation. Now, I want to tell you what kind of shield Paul was talking about. It's not a round shield like you see in the gladiator games, not a round shield about three feet across or two feet. It wasn't anything like that. 
The Roman soldier's shield was oblong. It measured about five feet from end to end. It was about two feet wide. It was made of two pieces of wood glued together with a handle on the back so he could hold it. It was heavy, but it was effective. It did exactly what it was intended to do. Now, in the Roman era, and in other eras too, but in the Roman era, one of the deadliest weapons, one of the most effective weapons against an army, in this case against the Roman army, were flaming arrows. You know? An enemy would dip the ends of their arrows, the tips of their arrows, into pitch and light them on fire and fire away. And all the Roman soldier had to do was stand behind his shield and duck down, and when that arrow hit his shield, it sank deep into the wood without penetrating it, and it extinguished the flame as it penetrated the wood. Paul wants you to keep that image in mind. We are to take up the shield of faith, which protects us, as he says, from all of those fiery darts of the enemy. It protects us. When you and I face temptation or some crisis, Paul says faith is what shields us. And for Paul, it's clear in other places of Paul's writing, faith means absolute trust in Christ. So when we walk close with Christ, Paul says we are safe from the fiery darts of temptation. Faith is our shield that protects us. Salvation is the next minimum daily requirement. And Paul pictures salvation as a helmet. It serves as a helmet. Salvation is what gives us the ability or the strength to overcome sin. And salvation is not just for sins we may have committed in the past. Salvation is for protection of sin or from sin in the future as well. Without salvation, you and I would be lost and open to every form of temptation. So Paul is encouraging us to take up, to put on this gift of salvation that Jesus offers so that we might protect ourselves from sinfulness. To put it on each day. It helps us remain strong and steady, ready to take a stand whenever we need to. The sixth part of the armor, and this is usually where we end. We don't go on to the seventh and think of it as armor, but I'm going to talk about seventh in a minute. But the sixth minimum daily requirement is, as Paul says, to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Scripture. Now, just like a Roman soldier's sword, the Scripture, Paul is trying to get across, the Scripture is both a, a weapon of defense and a weapon of attack. Our defense, a uh, uh, sword is our defense against the attack of sin. The scriptures are rather our defense against sin. And it is our weapon of attack against any sin or injustice we see around us. So it is both a weapon of defense against those sins and a weapon of attack against it in the world around us. In other words, we ought to be using, Paul says, scripture as a way to defend ourselves against sin and use the scripture as a way to attack the sins and injustice we see taking place around us. To stand strong, as he says, ready to take action. We cannot win God's battle if we do not know God's book. So we need to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the scripture, Paul says, and defend ourselves and fight against it wherever we see it. Now, those are the six pieces of armor that we usually remember somewhat, but there is another part that we often overlook simply because of the way that Paul writes about it at the end of the passage this morning. And it is, in Paul's mind, and in many of our minds, the greatest weapon of all, and that is the weapon of prayer. In fact, Paul mentions it three or four times in the last two or three verses of our lesson. And Paul mentions three specific things about prayer that make it part of our armor, that make it part of the minimum daily requirement to stay strong and healthy. He says, first of all, our prayers must be constant. He puts it this way, keep on praying. Or in some translations, pray without ceasing. Keep on praying. Our tendency 
is that our prayers are only when we're in a crisis, only when we're needing something. And it's not, as Paul says, constant. But it's only from daily prayer that we gain daily strength. So our prayer has to be constant. Then he says our prayer has to be intense. He puts it this way. Be sleepless in your prayer and pray in every crisis that you may be able to stand strong. It has to be intense. In other words, limp, weakness, weak, uh, half-hearted prayer doesn't get us anywhere. Doesn't do much good. Paul says the prayer that we need to take up every day is the kind of prayer that focuses all of our attention on God. It has to be intense and focused. And then finally he says our prayers have to be selfless. Constant, intense, and selfless. Again, Paul puts it this way. Pray for all the people of God, or all the saints, and pray for me as well. It has to be selfless. Too often our prayers are prayers only about ourselves and not nearly enough for others. We must learn how to pray for others at least as much as we pray for ourselves. Our prayers need to be selfless and intense and constant if they're going to help us stand strong in the face of whatever comes our way. So there you have it in a very brief kind of get you thinking kind of way those, those seven pieces of the armor, our minimum daily requirements for keeping our spiritual lives healthy and strong, ready to face whatever may come our way. And we can rest assured that there will be days when we are tempted and when we face evil and face some uncertainty and face weaknesses, but we can also rest assured that if we put on this whole armor of God that Paul writes about, truth, righteousness, the gospel, faith, salvation, the scripture, and prayer, if we take that up every day, we will stand firm in the face of it all and remain strong come what may. Let's pray again. Lord, we are grateful that you offer to us this armor that Paul talks about that helps us remain strong come what may. We pray that you help us to take it up and put it on each and every day that we may stand strong in times of crisis and in times of trial. And we will be thankful. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We respond to the good news of the day by the giving and receiving of our tithes and other offerings, and we it's a way of responding. And we'll pray as the ushers come, let's bow for our time of prayer of thanksgiving and commitment for these gifts that we're about to get. Let's pray together. Lord God, we give you thanks again for all that you have entrusted to us and given to us. You are always surprising us with your goodness and your grace, and so we are grateful we have this opportunity to return to you a small portion of all that you've given. And pray that you would use each gift and each one of us here for the work of the kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
join with me in affirming our faith again as a way of responding to the good news of the day. It is there in your bulletin. So let's join together. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the Savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God contained in the Old and New Testaments as a sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Our final hymn for this morning is number 513, Soldiers of Christ Arise. It is a familiar tune. You will know it as soon as you hear it. It's from Monty. You will know that tune. Uh, so it will be easy for us to pick up and sing. But if you'd like to come and spend some time in prayer here at the altar rail, recommit your life to Christ, or whatever you think God is calling you to do, this will be the time to do it. Let's sing. 513.
Go forth now from this place into the world, letting your light so shine that others might see your good works, but give glory to God in heaven. And we all say, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.